Um, so we have presentations that range from focusing on wider engagement and using digital resources to communicate more widely with local communities, um, along with looking at public participation in more detail and specifically the use of a new mo mobile heritage applications um, to facilitate this. We also have research focused on specialist fields of study, periods in time, and the applications of techniques and technologies, um, specifically looking at, um, or some examples, an evaluation of the role and symbolism of red deer in the Orcadian Neolithic, a more in-depth look at the um, counties of Lincolnshire and Yorkshire during the reign of King Stephen in the 12th century, before moving on to um, the geochemical analysis of soils and sediments, um, identifying lead pollutants, um, the use of spatial syntax analysis on archaeological sites, um, the use of GIS plotting and metal detecting survey. Um, it just, it's, it's endless really. And, and finishing with um, the investigation of substructures of Roman theatres in Italy. So an absolutely fantastic range um, of presentations that I hope you'll, you'll all enjoy. We will start with our, our first speaker, um, which is Elizabeth, um, and we will be sharing a recorded presentation from Elizabeth, which she is present to um, potentially ask her and answer any questions that you may have. Hello. For this presentation, I have applied the works of two other scholars using architectural spatial analysis theory in order to answer questions related to my research on the Herods of Roman Judea. The Herodian dynasty was a family of Roman Judean client kings of early Roman Judea who ruled in Palestine from the late first century BCE to the first Jewish war of CE 66 to 70. My thesis focuses on aspects of the lives of Herod the Great, the first Herodian ruler of Roman Judea and his grandson Agrippa I the last king of Roman Judea. Much discussion concerns the actual cultural identity of Herod the Great, and one aspect of this debate concerns whether he saw himself as a Hellenistic ruler or a Roman client king. Spatial analysis theory, when applied to architecture, can determine through the symbolic meanings found in structures the lifestyles and cultural thinking of those using the structures through an understanding of the way parts of the structures relate to one another. Certain parts of architecture are divided by entrances, including walls and gates, into external, internal, and private public areas, and between members, non-members of a group. My purpose for this study is to determine if there were reason to believe that Herod I was more Hellenistic or Greek in thinking and deserving of Greek respect than Agrippa I. Spatial analysis is one of the methods I'm using to obtain such information. Rejev applies one aspect of spatial analysis, access analysis, to several palaces of Herod the Great. In this process, building layout is reduced to charts with spaces being represented by circles and lines representing linkages, such as doorways or entrances. It is found that lavish spaces were for presentation, especially for Hellenistic monarchs, and simpler spaces were normally private and more hidden. In Herod's public palace spaces, there are more pagan friendly features, but mostly without graven images. In his private spaces, we interestingly find ritual vaths, which followed Jewish law, but Herod's lavishness seems very Hellenistic. One problem with using this analysis approach is that the symbolism may not represent the owner's true feelings, usage, or actual identity. A Hellenistic king had diverse qualities, including the ability to impress others, including foreigners, with his might, power, and wealth, as well as generosity and his ability to protect and care for his own subjects, also facilitated by his wealth who in this case were mainly the Jewish people, 
the Herods being Jewish converts and these being their main subjects. A Hellenistic king was also a man of culture and learning. In the audience hall and seated on his dais, the king shows his trufe, lavishness and majesty to visitors and foreign diplomats. He displayed his learning through his many scholarly guests and courtiers from diverse locations and through his Hellenistic symposiums, banquets, in which he showed his might and wealth as well. He also displayed this quality through his numerous palaces throughout his kingdom and his generosity, wealth and might through many donations and building projects in other cities and nations external to Judea, both perhaps to benefit the Jewish diaspora there and also to display his strength and generosity to foreigners, including at the Greek Olympics and in other parts of, of Greece, Syria and other locations. This served a political purpose and the donations purchased reciprocal help for his own people. Agrippa I, his grandson as king, was much more of a representative for the Jewish diaspora, including in times of crisis and when they clashed with Greek interests in Egypt, Palestine, and Syria. So Herod was thought well of by the Greeks, but Agrippa clashed with them, which may have contributed towards his sudden early death, if it was not from natural causes. Agrippa's own presentation was, I believe, Roman, and as a king, Roman and Jewish, so he was much more successful than Herod with his Jewish subjects. Herod's, Herod's palaces private quarters are small, so Rocha suggests he was not polygamous, as everyone thinks, but serial monogamous, divorcing his wives when they produced heirs, and that the ex-wives and children did not always live in his residential quarters, but perhaps nearby. The Jewish Maccabee Mariamne was his only queen, and he did not divorce her. Rocha suggests that at Herodium, the lower palace held Herod's private quarters and the smaller upper palace was for entertaining. In the Jericho first palace, the private rooms seem to have been in the west, north and east of the central courtyard. At Masada, the private rooms would have been in the center of the western palace and perhaps the upper floor. He had a library in his palace at Jerusalem. Public spaces housed Greek symposia and were often held in the peristyle courts, courtyards with porticos, gardens or audience halls and other lavish places and were decorated with mosaics and frescoes as display. A private symposium could be held in a less formal courtyard without porticos. Here is Rajev's axis analysis map of the main part of Herod's Western Palace at Masada, which Rocco and others believe held his private quarters. This palace was 28 by 24 meters and built early in his reign, circa 35 BCE. The circles represent spaces with the lines showing their entrances. This area would be the twin palaces and it contains 26 spaces and a central courtyard of 12 by 10.5 meters, leading to a triclinium, which led to a throne room of 8.7 by 6 meters. The central courtyard, as you can see, opens into six spaces and controls 22. The triclinium or dining area opens to two spaces from each side and controls three, plus four more, which are accessed from both the courtyard and the triclinium. The throne room is the largest room and is five spaces from the entrance to the palace and two from the courtyard. The map shows that the overall arrangement is sequestered. The bathhouse is seven spaces away and the mikveh or ritual bath is six spaces away, so they are in the private area. 
Since the lavish spaces are still hidden, this indicates that the palace was used for a few important private visitors who accessed Herod's Hellenistic true faith display, but in a private way. The private mikveh actually is one indication of Herod's personal Jewishness, despite the ter stereotype that he wasn't really Jewish. But like the other Judean elite, he was probably a liberal Jew. There were no peristyle courts, unlike the Jericho, Caesarea, and Herodium palaces, and there was a bent, indirect entrance to the central court. It was a smaller palace, so its use was personal and for individual guests. The king was thus remote, but his Hellenistic magnificence and trufe are still symbolized in the large throne room and mosaics, and this is not seen in any Hasmonean Maccabee palaces from the previous Jewish dynasty the Herods supplanted. In the early part of Herod's reign, he was at war with the Parthians and the last Maccabee king, and, and once he hid his family at Masada, which may explain its privateness. This can be contrasted with Herod's first Jericho palace or gymnasium built later in around 35 BCE. It is larger, 87 by 46 meters with 44 spaces and a complex organization with three central spaces. The entrance room controls 19 service rooms. The triclinium and the wide courtyard control 11 spaces and a large peristyle, central peristyle courtyard of 42 by 35 meters at the center of the palace controls the rest of the spaces. So a large number of guests could be hosted at the same time in the peristyle courtyard who could view the, the king in his triclinium and his trufe. Its courtyard is only two spaces from its threshold, and the triclinium is only three spaces away from it. Herod's accessibility means his wanting his honor and fame seen directly at the beginning of his reign. There were ritual baths and a Roman bathhouse for the visitors and courtiers. Behind the triclinium were 11 private rooms for Herod, including his own private ritual bath, which is again significant. The spatial analysis method can also be used to extract information from the spatial relationships between structures and locations. Distribution maps or vector analysis might be used for the analysis. I have also applied spatial research by Pazut on a group of fortresses between the northern Negev and Beersheba in the southern Negev of Roman Palestine. Pazut mapped the relationships between the fortresses to assess their interconnectedness to determine their possible purpose as a unit. My interest concerns one of these fortresses, that of Tel Malhata, believed to have been the Malata location mentioned by Josephus in his Antiquities. Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod the Great, around 10 years before he came, became king, left Rome and hid, I believe, partly for political reasons, in a tower at Malata. This was either in the temporarily abandoned Malhata fortress itself or in a remote fortified property nearby. This area was part of Idumea, the Herod's ancestral homeland. Although Agrippa had grown up in Rome and this was probably his first time back in Palestine. The Negev, especially its south, was important in Roman times as a trade passageway between Arabia and the Mediterranean including for frankincense. Malhata Fortress was in the arid south and occupied a central cro crossroads north to south between the Negev and Judea and east to west between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean. 
The fortress was 75 by 55 meters and has been partly excavated. The enchant enclosure is 1.25 meters wide and built of rough ashlars. Archaeological excavations of Tel Malhata, including numanistic and potsherd remains, have shown it to have been abandoned, perhaps due to the change of government. Between the reigns of the last Hasmonean Maccabee kings and the mid first century CE. The area was used by Bedouin and caravans, and Pazut believed it may have supervised a caravansary. The Negev of early Roman Palestine occupied the valley of Nahal Beersheba in southern Roman Palestine. This is a circa 48 kilometer wide arid area of desert mountains, plateaus, and wadis, receiving between 150 in the south to 200 in the north millimeters of rainfall yearly, which can allow for dry farming, especially in the north. Concentrations of well water existed around Beersheba, Tel Malhata, and Orer due to the high underground water table. Tel Malhata is in the center of the valley of Nahal Beersheba, near the joining of Nahal Malhata and Nahal Beersheba, and 10 meters above its surrounding level. All roads during this period traveling through the region, except on the Aroer Beersheba and Arad Uza routes had their starting points at Malhata, so it is believed all travelers needed to pass through this region. There is 2.5 kilometers of paved Roman road found extending north to south between Malhata and Hebron. There was a leading pre-Roman road traveling through Malhata and Beersheba connecting the Dead Sea with the Mediterranean Sea. Another pre-Roman road from Malhapa, Ma, Malhata to Hebron. Since Agrippa would have been there possibly briefly in approximately the late 20s to around the time coinciding with Tiberius Praetorian Prefect Sejanus' death in CE 31, he was there when it was abandoned, except for occasional Bedouin herders, so he obviously needed a place to hide. Josephus states that Agrippa was hiding from imperial creditors, but he was, at, he was close to Antonia Minor, who later incriminated Sejanus. Since Malhata was inhabited at this time, uninhabited at this time, he could also have hidden in the actual fortress. According to Pazut's spatial ana analysis survey, since Malhata is at a low elevation, it cannot see beyond a few kilometers and thus can only view the neighboring fortresses of Arad and Tel Ira. Malhata could only connect with Arad and Mizbea forts with one connection. In the northwestern Roman Negev, there were many more forts, not over 3.5 kilometers apart, and much more visibility between the forts, even distant ones. But the southern and eastern portion, which is semi-desert, had a sparse nomadic population here. The fortress sites are further apart, and most of these fortress sites are not intervisible. Even in the northern areas, forts are inwardly oriented and used more for local community and road policing rather than as limelines. The denser presence of forts in the northern Negev might also imply a worsening security situation in Roman Judea when it came under direct Roman rule after the death of Agrippa I, which led to the Jewish revolts. Agrippa I, when he became king, because he was part Maccabee, he had a clearly stronger pro-Jewish policy than the other Herods, and Josephus says the Jews were shocked when he suddenly died 
and most of the later procurators were harsher and therefore needed a strong military presence in the countryside against um, reacting rebels. There were up to 200 soldiers plus detachments in the northern Negev. The southeast where Malhata was, was semi-desert with scattered Bedouin. The southeast was more important for its trade routes and commerce. There was not much need for signaling, so the forts are spaced further apart, but they might have been located close to Bedouin tribes to defend the areas against bandits and had a commercial focus. There is a gap in knowledge of Agrippa's activities in the middle to late twenties, and it is not sure when he left Rome for Palestine. Then in circa CE 31, he worked for his uncle Antipas in Tiberias as a market ag agronomist or overseer. And I wonder if before this, he worked for a while in the Malata area with the Bedouin trade situation. Problems involve the limited stratigraphic excavations performed in the Negev, and only part of Malhata has been excavated. Pazut says there is often a lack of correlation between the visible structures and the surface material gathered. If Malhata although at a central crossroads for important trade routes was temporarily abandoned, the alternate routes were probably used at this time and the area was perhaps more peaceful before the period of direct Roman rule and therefore required less surveillance. Thank you for your interest. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. That was that was really interesting look at spatial syntax, which I, I've got no knowledge about, um, but it's really interesting applications to that particular period um, in history. Okay, well, we'll move on um, to the, the next presentation now, um, which is um, from Sonia, um, the University of York, um, and I'll let you present yourself, Sonia, and um, you're doing a live presentation. So thank you very much. So uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to my presentation um, titled Presenting Hair Tap, a new heritage. Oops, sorry about that. Um, a new heritage mobile application for promoting citizen participation and tackling the imbalance in cultural visits. Well, um, my name is Sonia Pujals. Um, I'm, I was a student of the master's at the University of York in cultural heritage management, but I am also an archaeologist specializing in cultural heritage management and digital archaeology. So first of all, um, let me thank the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists for organizing this interesting conference and also for the opportunity to be here today. And also my appreciation to the other speakers for sharing your research and your attention. So uh, basically the subject of my talk is to present a heritage application I have just developed. Um, my research is also designed to act as a springboard for discussion about the role of heritage apps in addressing issues related to heritage management and preservation. And so today's outline is going to be a background, ends of objectives, methodology, development, and just we're gonna finish with some conclusions of this research. So because we want to be talking about uh, cultural heritage, first, I think it's of paramount importance to just try to define what cultural heritage is. Obviously, and maybe you agree with me, you see I too, but I think it's a topic open to debate, but there is a general acceptance, and I'm quoting, that cultural heritage ranges from the tangible to the intangible, from traditions and practices to monuments, landscapes, and artifacts of our day-to-day -day life. But currently, multiple processes affect and potentially threaten cultural heritage and impact society at the level of self-conception and identity of the individual. When it comes to the background and the literature review, um, so the literature review of this research has centered around the state of affairs and prospects for cultural visits. So the first point would be a phenomenological approach. Uh, this is the one where the experiential aspect prevails, so it's the most important thing. I think that would be an optimal starting point for studying the relationship dynamics with our heritage environment, 
because this approach will allow us to explore the sensations people, in this case, visitors experience when they are visiting a heritage site. And that will allow us just to go a step beyond just the educational function and to delve into their own experience of the phenomenon. And also providing the management area with tools to encourage visits based on research of the phenomenon of experience, the visitor experience will be highly improved which is highly beneficial for the visitor, but in turn, user experience improvement will increase visitor satisfaction and the flow of visitors will be much increased. Also, when it comes to behavioral intentions for cultural heritage tourism, uh, it's, it's not something new that uh, cultural organizations uh, urgently need promotion due to the instability and conditions experienced by the sector. But then, um, and this is something, something which is not new, but the crisis, the crisis generated by the COVID-19 pandemic has negatively contributed to the laborious process of just generating interest in cultural business from a global perspective. Yet, I do think this situation has a positive side, given that the noticeable drop in cultural visits provides time for reflection. We do have more time to think where are we going and the things we can improve, and just to know how the public engagement is being managed with current parameters. Then I think that any application aimed at promoting heritage must demonstrate a deep knowledge of cultural consumption behaviors so as to shed light on new cultural planning strategies. Another point would be that from school age to the age of intellectual maturity, cultural sites are a reference of knowledge. We just go there to nourish ourselves with our history and we try to establish bonds as social entities. But I argue that if the objective is to combat um, inequality and a really low flow of visitors, uh, we need to improve uh, heritage experience and not only the educational role of these sites. So I think that the consolation between the concept of education, existence and experience should be the foundation of for building a fruitful relationship between society and its heritage. Another issue is the fluctuating, fluctuating density of visitors, which entails problems of forecasting resources and infrastructures, and at the same time, it hinders the, the ability to offer a satisfactory cultural experience to visitors, because you don't know how, like, the amount of visitors that you're going to have, and it's difficult just to predict. So in response to this issue, Heritab has a component to promote cultural visits based on gamification. Uh, so basically, uh, visitors will participate in cultural raffles, some cultural uh, um, rewards for each visit they register via this smartphone application. And this way, having control over the period periodicity of the rewards program will allow addressing fluctuations in visitor density. So in other words, the managerial area of the site will have the possibility to appraise the periods with the lowest flow of visitors and then they could just implement a strategies uh, of gamification to promote business through the rewards program. When it comes to the aims and objectives, um, um, so when it comes to aims and objectives, um, the starting point has been to identify the real needs of the heritage market and to offer a positive and innovative contribution to the total of existing heritage applications. On the one hand, it has been detected an imbalance in the number of visits here on the left. Uh, hence, Heritab just tried just, just to solve this problem aims to incentivize the visit to less visited sites via the gamification and a rewards program. So uh, any visitor going to uh, less visited sites will receive more coins per visit. On the other hand, uh, it has been detected a problem of communication between like the audience and then the cultural organizations. And so to solve this heritage preservation problems and break the barrier between audiences and heritage manager, it provides visitors with the opportunity to become active agents in heritage preservation. So this direct feedback will strongly reinforce the dialogue and cooperation between heritage sites, managers, and visitors. We just want the audience to know 
we just want them to have uh, their voices uh, to be heard so they can contribute to that. When it comes to methodology, uh, we need to talk about targeting audiences. So the success of a smartphone application majorly depends on the proper choice of the target audience and the marketing strategies implemented just to enhance the use of this application. Because to understand customer needs, it's of primary importance to define the target audience. Because when designing for a general audience, we might tend to design for ourselves and that would be a problem of usability of the application. And so uh, in this case, it has been possible to stipulate a population target audience between 25 and 50. And also Heritab has made an all out effort to offer an inclusive application. We just want this application to be for, for everyone and particularly for visually impaired users. That's why we have, um, as you can see, we have implemented some strategies like applying larger font uh, size, a clear calligraphy and space in between lines, and also just to uh, avoid color, red, green uh, color blindness, we have avoid the use of these red and green colors in adjacent spaces that will enhance the usability of the application. When we talk about consumer psychology in heritage visits, um, I just want to mention a study conducted by Fang and Arifin. He's a pioneer, so they are pioneers in applying experiential marketing uh, expertise. And it's based on three central notions when you talk about the, the visitor experience. These are service experience, novelty experience, and leisure experience. And the research just illustrated that the most determining variables for visiting a cultural site are service experience and the leisure experience. And these are closely related to the value of loyalty because we want the audience just to return to the place, okay? To establish some loyalty bond. Also the rapid pace with which immersive technology has been introduced in the heritage visit sector implies an unstoppable increase in the demands of living a highly stimulating experience just to meet the visitor's leisure requirements. We are so overexposed to different and, and some stimulation, just visual and, and of any kinds. And so we need to be offering a new and a truly good experience um, to the visitor. That's the requirement today. But um, offering leisure is unfeasible in some types of heritage visits. Um, that's the case of sites categorized as dark tourism because that's a clear example of the need to apply models to encourage cultural visits that are flexible and adaptable to the different natures of cultural heritage sites just to be respectful to the sites and to the memory on them. And when we talk about the term cultural heritage tourism, we have this commonly response to visiting places that hold stories from both the recent and distant past, but these places also reflect traditions that are endogenous or exogenous and narrate experiences that portray the society once involved and continues to be. So the association between cultural heritage and cultural tourism established the prevalence of the educational value of heritage over the other values. Yet, I truly believe that it is in indispensable to acknowledge the totality of values of, of the heritage sites and just citing historic England conservation principles, um, they outline the significance of heritage is categorized into four values, uh, historical, aesthetic, evidential, and communal. And so I think that recognizing these essential values will truly encourage cultural tourism attract by other factors, such as entertainment and heritage sites, not just the educational role. And there on the right, we have the chain of factors. This is an empirical study conducted by Chen and Chen in 2010. It concludes that perceived value, experience quality, and satisfaction are permeable compartments where the failure of one of them affects the final value the visitor gives to their visit to heritage sites. That's why it's important just to acknowledge all of them. Here in, in the UX Honeycomb, we're talking about UX design and the use, not just about the interface, so it's like the visual part, but also the user experience. So how the uh, application is being developed, okay, in program. So Heritab, uh, as, as I just said, it's a native 
smartphone and heritage application that encourage cultural visits while promoting interaction between the public and heritage professionals. So the development of this application has had as its central objective the UX design. Why? Because from time saving and more significant interaction with our surroundings to effective learning, a well-designed user interface is an essential factor in HeritAB. Next, I'm going just to exemplify the UX design decisions uh, with actual um, screens from this application. So the first thing we wanted to do was just to offer a minimalist design that we did that uh, applying clear headlines, common universal icons. We want the user to be familiarized with them. So to make a good usage of them. We also created the headphone icon just to create or to foster a sense of community. We also um, uh, implement an extraction of the extra color. We created this color, this Condish color, and also abundance of negative space. This will be one of the heritage sites um, screens. And also, as we mentioned, um, we are on one of the aims is to be accessible. And so, uh, so you can see here that would be the screen of a user that has one reported size. This user might have seen a visitor, might have seen some problems. And so he has the complete list here. So we have add a translucent color layer just to enhance visibility. And we also have to try to avoid the uh, red green color blindness. As you can see, we opt for these two colors. So when it comes to the development of Heritab, um, because it's quite long, I just would like to point out some key ideas on how the conceptual and theoretical base has materialized in the UX and UI, so user experience and user interface of the application. And one really good example is the intuitive research map. So that would be the map that you will have on the application. So it allows you to explore all sites in an area. It facilitates the planning. So you just decide, okay, I want to go to visit some heritage nearby. So you have all the lists and it's clearly there, there's a visual differentiation between less visited to most visited. And that is important because it raises awareness of the heritage size density of an area, because if you don't see them there, maybe you have never heard about them. And, um, these application screens show are the ones designed for both the most visited sites and less visited sites. And so um, in order to balance visits, gamification in Heritage has been applied as follows. So visits to most visited sites will reward one Harry coin, okay? While the visit to less visited sites will reward two Harry coins. Why? Because that way visitors can also win prices, cultural prices, if they visit most visited sites. We didn't want to have any negative effects on this uh, more rewarded, okay, sites or more known sites. But regarding the imbalance in heritage uh, sites, I think it's interesting to delve into the repercussions generated by institutional designations, such as the one granted by UNESCO. So having a UNESCO um, designation, it's good because it provides a site with prestige and protection. But then on the other hand, because of this promotion, they have a higher density of visitors and that could lead to preservation issues. That's something you need to take into account. But on the other hand, uh, less visited sites, they need for promotion. They are lacking of public recognition. And because they are poorly funded, they also have preservation issues. That's why it's so important just to balance uh, cultural visits. When we talk about um, the development, um, so notably the imbalance in visits, difficult just to accurately estimate the flow of visitors, which is decisive with respect to regional economies, the assessment of, of environmental carrying capacity, and the provision of the necessary infrastructure to accommodate the flow of visitors, and that's a problem. So cultural raffles, it's a good option because they will also boost um, or increase regional economies by attracting new visitors to less known areas because this app facilitates the planning of visits, thus increasing the prospect of staying longer in the area and, the, and that will increase the economic growth that would lead to that. Um, also, 
Um, on the other hand, when on the second uh, objective of promoting citizen participation via the Ripper button, it truly aims to solve heritage preservation problems and break the barrier between audiences and heritage managers. We just want the audience to know that they can contribute to cultural heritage um, preservation. And so just to finish con uh, the conclusions, so this study aimed to balance heritage visits via gamification and to promote citizen participation with heritage through the report, uh, the problem report function. So we done some usability testing, obviously, and some research. And so the results of this test, this testing just showed that the original project objectives have been mainly achieved. So it has been possible to develop an application that provides solutions to these problems based on UX design, psychology of positive, uh, positive enforcement and consumer behavior patterns. It has been able to develop a smartphone application for cultural visits that makes a difference in the high tech sector. And finally, this study helps to better achieve sustainable tourism which revolves around estimating the current and future economic, social, and environmental impacts of tourism on a region. Therefore, the balancing heritage species will contribute importantly to controlling the effects of tourism and heritage assets by balancing them, and also encouraging dialogue through the report function will facilitate meeting visitors' needs, the culture industry, and the environment. And that will be all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sonia. Um, that was that was brilliant. Um, I think as well with um, uh, with the, the recent eighteen months, the, the importance of engaging kind of techn technological and digital um, uh, approaches to engaging people um, has shown that it, it's essential at the moment. And I think um, the development of a heritage app um, sounds fantastic um, to me. Um, if anybody has any specific questions, we're running a little bit behind. But if anybody has any specific questions, can they pop them in the chat? Um, for Sonia specifically about that heritage app and Sonia if you're able to probably put a bit of information in the chat maybe about where people can access that maybe or access more information okay, about sure. that 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 would be great um if, does anybody have any um quick questions if they want to pop their hands up um otherwise if you can pop them in the chat that would be brilliant and we might be able to pick them up later on um but once again, thank you ever so much, Sonia. That was that was thank fantastic. Um, and somebody, Ryan, has just asked a question in the chat. So if you're able to um, answer that in the chat, that would be wonderful. Thank you. That's great. Thank um, you. So we'll move on now to our third presentation, um, which is um, uh, from Catherine Page of the University of the Highlands and Islands in Orkney. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Catherine. Hi there. Thanks ever so much. I'll just uh, get my screen up for you. And um, thank you for asking me to speak today. Uh, so I'd like to tell you about my um, master's research, which is looking at the significance of red deer in the Orcadian Neolithic and using the Ness of Bogga as one of the case studies. Um, so my supervisors are Professor Ingrid Mainland and Nick Card, who is the site director from the Ness of Bogga. Okay, so uh, first off then really is, um, hopefully people know where Orkney is. Um, obviously, you can probably tell I'm not Orcadian, but um, I do live on Orkney. Um, so it's an archipelago of 70 islands that is uh, 10 miles off the north coast of Scotland and probably most well known for the um, amount and preservation of its Neolithic archaeology. Um, the Red Cross on there is where I live, which is down in South Ronaldsey, and the Gold Cross is Scarra Bray. And just to give you an idea of, of the size of the islands, it's a 45 minute drive from my house to to where I work at Scarabray. So it's, um, it's, they're quite large islands uh, that we're, we're looking at here. So why red deer really? Well, um, red deer seem to have had um, a liminal uh, existence really, somewhere between the wild and the domesticate. And they appear to have been purposely introduced to the Orkney Islands during the Neolithic period. There is some evidence from palynology to suggest that there was um, large animal disturbances on the islands around about 7,000 years, uh, years ago, and that's been currently being investigated further to see whether or not this was actually red deer, which might as you know, make the assumption that they were indigenous to the islands but went through some kind of extinction event. But the fact remains that they were introduced at some point during the Neolithic um, for reasons that we're not quite sure about. 
Um, what we have discovered and the reason for the study is that we have several sites across Orkney where there are red deer heaps, where there are bodies of unprocessed red deer, particularly associated with settlement sites. We also have um, butchery sites that are uh, associated with settlement sites um, and there looks like there is some kind of off settlement site processing of red deer and Niall Sharples looked at this in 2000 and made some suggestions that um, there are rituals and taboos around the consumption of and the processing of red deer. So more recently at the Nessa Brogga excavation, um, we found that there was also deposits of red deer, particularly associated with structure 10. And uh, research was being done by Professor Mainland and others at uh, looking at the animal bone groups from structure 10 particularly and using what was called a smart faunal approach to excavating these remains, which involve using GIS mapping and um, 3D photogrammetry of um, the bone assemblages prior to them being excavated so that they could be looked at in, in terms of distribution and spatial analysis. And finally, a reassessment of the fauna report from the point of Buckhoy, uh, not far from Scarborough Bray, uh, which was excavated in the 1970s, seems to suggest that there was another deer heap here which has been uh, missed up until now. So that really is the, the, the background of, of, of where we are. So the aim of my study really was to determine the significance that Red Hill held for communities during the Neolithic period by investigating the depositional practices across uh, settlement and burial sites, um, as there appeared to be quite um, some contrast between the post-mortem treatment of animals depending on where they were being deposited. And as I was saying, the, the Nessa Brogga was being used as, as a case study for this. So some of the issues that um, we came across really um, was the fauna reports and not just antiquarian ones really, but quite modern fauna reports deal with domesticates and non-domesticates very differently in terms of how uh, assemblages are recorded and what information is recorded. Um, NISP and MNI, so a number of individual species and minimal number of individuals, um, were often absent when it came to non-domesticated species. Percentages um, of total assemblages was often missing from fauna reports as well. Another issue that we had was with regard to antler. Antler was often um, classified as non-specific bone, therefore trying to find it was quite difficult. And in the case of the Nessa Brogga, it involved trawling through 87 boxes of uh, animal bones to try and find some red deer and some antler. Uh, antlers also recorded very often as tools. Um, and so again, that means searching for it in different sections of artifact reports. And so as a result, the kind of overall picture of red deer exploitation is, is often missing from the narrative. The other things that we need to consider here is obviously the links of Neutland and Nessa Brogga and our ongoing excavations and the data will change. And so obviously what I've um, sort of concluded really um, is just based on our current knowledge and, the, and current excavation. One of the other interesting things to, to point out is about physiology and morphology. It's a well-known phenomenon that um, island species of animals uh, change quite considerably in terms of size and also in terms of um, sex ratios as well. Um, we do find over time, particularly in the Orkney assemblages, that towards the Iron Age we tend to have a very smaller um, size of animal population compared to the Neolithic. Some of that is due to um, just this natural phenomenon of, of, of animals shrinking in, in, in island communities, but it also could be selection uh, in terms of species selection. The other thing we were looking at as well is, a, is age of death profiles, really to try and get some evidence of, of herding strategies and herding management. <clears throat> you know, we, we obviously have very um, conclusive data in terms of how sheep and uh, cattle and, and pigs to a certain extent were being managed um, during the Neolithic on Orkney. Uh, what we don't know is things like how these animals were managed on a day-to-day -day basis. We have no evidence for things like um, field boundaries. Um, so were these animals free roaming? And in which case, 
uh, were their behavior being tolerated in terms of accessing crops and eating crops? And does that mean that resources were quite abundant at that time? So there's a lot that we don't know in, in terms of just the general day-to-day -day management of these animals. But what we do know is that they were there and we do know that they were significant. And this significance seems to have changed over time. So firstly, I wanted to have a look at mortuary sites. Um, so Morris, who excavated the point of Buckhoy, uh, which is a settlement site, um, which I don't know if you can see my mouth, but a mouse, but it's just this uh, bit that sticks out here, which uh, you'll see on the uh, next slide. Um, when he was excavating, he said that there was a correlation between red deer deposition in stored cairns, uh, which we also call Orkney quality types. And, um, in, in Orkney, we have these two types, which are uh, Orkney quality and maize how type tombs. And these, uh, in a very sort of basic crass way, um, store cairns tend to be older. Uh, they tend to have been more oval in shape with internal um, segmentation, whereas maize how type tombs have cells that come off a, a central chamber. However, um, the data that I was looking at suggested that there was actually a higher association between red deer deposition and the maize how type tombs. What we were also seeing was that the Rousey assemblages, which is in the, um, the yellow circle there, and some of you may know that Rousey is often referred to as the Egypt of the North due to the uh, proliferation of Neolithic tombs on the island. What we had here was an abundance really of red deer being deposited in the, the tombs here. And, and we had um, a minimum number of individuals upwards of 36 in some of the tombs that were here. We also found that um, the assemblages were often burnt and also had evidence for consumption, which was unusual because other than two other tombs uh, across the rest of the islands, this was the only place that we had evidence for this. Another point of interest was the deposition of antler. Um, basically, there was very little of it. Um, I come from Wessex originally, and there is a high association between antler uh, in the mortuary context down there and also in um, around sites uh, that have been constructed. Um, and it started to make me wonder whether there might be an association between antler peaks and flint. Um, the soil in Orkney is very different and using cattle scapula as digging tools would have been more than adequate. Even though we have quite a high number of red deer, we seem to have very little antler. And so where, it was, where it's been going, what they've been doing with it, we're not sure. Um, but what we do have is a, a bit of an anomaly. And so the home of Pape, which is right at the top there under the black circle, um, we have 564 fragments of antler found, all quite small. And Harmon, who did the fauna report, believed that they probably equate to about 17 or 18 antler. A previous excavation done in the late 1800s by George Petrie found 12 antler here. So this is the only place across the whole of the Orkney Islands where we have any substantial antler. We have no antler caches, we have no tools um, or very small amount of tools um, in these mortuary sites. So again, um, although that's not something I'm particularly looking at here, it would certainly be a, another research investigation to look at why we have this lack of, of um and compared to a sizable population. Uh, so the final thing I was doing, which was based on a uh, research survey that was undertaken by Jones, who predominantly looked at the tombs in Rousey, was to look at whether there was any hierarchy associated with um, other animals deposited with uh, red deer and mortuary sites. Interesting that what we have is a 92% association with sheep, um, and then wild animals come second, and they're predominantly birds. And then what you have then is only 44% association with cattle on mortuary sites. So, um, you know, quite interesting. Again, I mean, I, my personal feeling would have been that, that cattle would have been higher. So over on the settlement sites then, um, what we have here is this association with these heaps. Uh, the links of Neutland, uh, which is our, the uh, circle dot on the top of the page there, um, we have 15. Uh, in one area at uh, Point of Buckhoy, uh, which is the second one down, uh, we have eight. And then the Bayer Scale, which actually is a, a butchery site associated with Scarabray, uh, we have four. Um, all of these animals were unprocessed and there's no evidence of butchery and they were deposited whole. The uh, deer heaps at Links of Neutland at the Point of Buckhoy and at Scale 
also seem to be orientated um, towards the east of boundary wall features. So again, indicating that these were purposeful and may well evidence um, structural deposition. At the Nessa Brogga, we have an MNI currently of three associated with structure 10, but that will increase as the excavations continue. Here, however, the deer are disarticulated and they are placed around structure 10. And these are associated with sheep and cattle deposits. Structure 10 is really interesting because this is also known as a cathedral site. And uh, excavations here, which was undertaken using the uh, smart, smart fauna approach, discovered that the cattle deposits are all tibia and they equate to the equivalent of 400 individual uh, animals that were placed into this one building. Also, we found at the Nessa Brugge a very small amount of antler again, um, and even across all of the settlement sites, we're only looking at 25 pieces, and they're either classified as tools or um, they were discovered as non-specific bone, um, hence uh, having to trawl through all those boxes. The other thing that we've discovered here is the butchery sites are predominantly coastal, but we have to really take that with a massive pinch of salt. So if we look at the Skara Braith um, dot, which is here in the middle here, you've got the two butchery sites either side of the, uh, the um, settlement of Skara Bray. But what you have to remember is when Skara Bray was constructed, the sea was actually two miles away. So um, the likelihood is that these sites were not coastal. It's just the fact that coastal erosion has um, you know, brought them to our attention. Another interesting point to make is the red circle here on the right is that we've got these two butchery sites here uh, on the east mainland and there are no known Neolithic settlement sites here. But what we do have is two Iron Age sites and it may well be that these uh, red deer butchery sites are associated with uh, Iron Age sites, which would also be interesting because it would may mean that maybe whatever cultural significance is to attach to the processing of red deer uh, during the Orcade and Neolithic may have actually continued later on. So the other thing I was looking at is uh, age of death profiles, um, really to answer this question about lack of antler and also to look at whether or not we've got evidence for um, culling and um, the purposeful management of herds here. So overall, we were able to identify 36 individuals that we could age, and the majority of them were culled under three years. Um, and so, you know, it's if we're looking at domesticates, particularly sheep, you'd be looking at this as being prime meat bearing age. Um, in terms of venison and red deer, um, this doesn't quite fit. So the question is, obviously, is, is why were they being culled at this age? Were they likely to get too big um, after this? Would they be a drain on resource or was this about management? Um, I have tried to have a look at sex profiling, but so far we've only been able to sex six of the deer and we have three of each, uh, two of which we were able to sex due to the uh, presence of um, in utero fetuses. So the native brogger then, so um, this is what we're being used as a case study. Um, it's not you know, you can't really say it's a settlement site. There's something else going on here. So we tend to refer to it as a complex and, and it's possibly as a, a temple complex. And this was discovered in 2003 and it's an ongoing excavation. One of the issues with the nest is that there are variable preservation of organic remains across the sites. And obviously this needs to be taken into account when we're looking at the fauna assemblages. Um, you know, for instance, when I was looking at some of the deer bones that were coming out of structure eight, beautiful uh, honey colored um, long bones um, coming out of the trenches within feet of bones that just look like mud. So, you know, we have this very localized preservation. So as I said before, a smart fauna process was used to excavate structure 10, which you can see to the right of the picture there. So it's huge, this really large um, walls uh, structure. 85% of the fauna assemblage from the whole of um, Nessa Brogga has come out predominantly of structure 10. So this tells you just how many bones were, were coming out of this one building. So currently the, the red deer MMI is 19 for the whole site and the NISP is 53. The MMI for uh, structure 10 is three. And as I said, this will change um, as the assemblage is catalogued. 
So this is some of the examples of antler that we were coming out and it's a bit rubbish really. Um, that we didn't find very much at all. Um, and as you can see from this, we are not dealing with any antler caches and it doesn't seem to be that and this is being purposefully deposited. Um, the antler hasn't been um, particularly worked in any way. And as you can see, um, particularly from the deer antler that we're coming out of trench tea, uh, the preservation is, is really variable. Uh, the red dot at the top of trench tea is uh, for another piece of antler that was found, but that came from the Iron Age uh, context uh, at the top of trench tea. So, you know, this is telling us something really. I mean, this, this absence of antler uh, in comparison with the amount of red deer that we were uncovering across the whole of the Neolithic assemblage is, is just tiny. Um, and at the moment, you know, trying to uncover explanations for this uh, when we, you know, on the small sample that we can sex, it seems to be that we have uh, equal ratio of male and female. And we seem to have, be having a breeding population. So we should have, uh, you know, quite a few males um, present in the herd. Uh, just makes you wonder really what we're doing, what was being done with this antler. And that is not something, unfortunately, I can answer at this time. So the final part, really, um, going back to Morris's suggestion of this link between um, Orkney chromatine and stored cairns and the deposition of um, red deer was to obviously look at radiocarbon dates. Now, one of the issues that we do have is, you know, as you're probably aware, is radiocarbon dating changes over time. Um, it becomes more sophisticated. And then obviously Bayesian statistical analysis is, is added onto this as well. So one of the things that we must bear in mind here, particularly with the mortuary context, is that these were very early um, excavations. Um, many of them were antiquarian excavations. Um, and the radiocarbon dating that was done was, was predominantly in the 1980s. Now, Alison Sheridan uh, et al. in 2017 were looking at um, some of the assemblages across the tombs and redating them, as did the um, Oceans of Time project, which is in Colin Rich's book uh, about the Neolithic house societies. And there's a chapter there that readdresses um, radiocarbon dating. So the dates that we have on here are the most recent, um, but as I say, we, we do need to caveat that. So in terms of the mortuary sites, what we're looking at is that the earliest deposition of red deer is around 3,350 to 2,550, and that's from Ramsey, which is one of the tombs on Rousey. The latest date that we have for deposition of red deer is 2,840 to 2,479 BC, which is from the home of Pape North, which is where we had all that antler coming out from. So all of these dates are mid to late Neolithic. So this is really interesting because uh, excavations that were undertaken at the Napa Hawa, which were um, very early Neolithic site, were suggesting that there was red deer present there. However, part of this um, reassessment of radiocarbon dates is now suggesting that the Napa Hawa red deer is a lot later. So if we compare this then to settlement sites, um, so we now have to discount the Napa Hawa um, uh, red deer. Uh, assemblage. The earliest date that we have is 2859 to 2491 BC, and that's from the Links in Oitland. So they're pretty much we, you know, we can um, trust these dates because these are very recent. And the latest deposition that we have then is 2100 BC to 2030 Cal BC, which is coming from the butchery site at Scale, which is next to Scarra Bray. And all of the uh, settlement sites, what we're seeing is that we have three late Neolithic dates and then eight late dates into the Chalcolithic period. So what we're looking at here is, is something really interesting in that it seems to be in, in, in implying that the status of red deer has changed and the how you red deer were being used changes. So we have a slight overlap between um, the last deposition in mortuary sites and the first evidence of them in settlement sites. But it seems to be that over this sort of transition from the mid to the late Neolithic, the status and the significance of red deer and what they come to represent is somehow changing. When we look at uh, the Nessa Brogger, again, we have something very interesting happening here. So the cattle from structure 10, uh, the last date that we have for that was a date of deposition of around 2400 Cal BC. However, the red deer 
is 2,205 to 2,025 Cal BC. So this suggests that the red deer were actually deposited 200 years later. Now, the castle is associated with a decommissioning feasting deposit. And so we have to ask, why did they go back 200 years later? Why did they uh, deposit the red deer? And what was the function of that? The links in Nortland paper, um, The End of the World, um, it kind of talks about red deer being associated with crisis or closings. And the flip side to that may be that perhaps red deer are about new beginnings. So there is, you know, the, the, the red deer are signifying something very important and they're associating with changes in culture and the monumentality and decommissioning of structures. Um, and so that's kind of where I am at the moment in terms of trying to take this study forward and, and, and what this all means really. So in conclusion then, uh, what we have is the first evidence of red deer being deposited around 3,350 BC. So this in itself is really interesting because it starts to question this early introduction of red deer to the Northern Isles, which was suggested from the assemblage from the Napa Hawa. The assumption has always been that red deer were introduced quite early. However, if all these dates are to be trusted, and, and as I did say, they do need to be revisited, um, then actually we could have a much later date for introduction to red deer to the Northern Isles. Um, we also have this uh, association with the Calcolithic period, and we have to question, you know, what was going on in Orkney on a local level um, and, and what the significance of red deer means to uh, what was happening at that time. We have this change in post-mortem treatment in settlement sites and in mortuary contexts and how red deer are being treated. The only evidence that we have uh, for sort of feasting of red deer really comes from Tofsnes and from Sande, uh, sorry, from Paul, which are both on Sande. And what we have here is that uh, we also have um, deposition of whole cattle. So it's almost like they are depositing the cattle in a very purposeful way and eating red deer at particular times, which is the sort of flip side of what we're seeing uh, across some of the other islands. And so that uh, will obviously... Um, require some further investigation really just to understand that in, in, in more fully really about why we have these very localized uh, differences in terms of depositional practices. So finally, I'd just like to thank you for listening to uh, my research. I'd also like to thank Nick Card and Anne Mitchell um, from Nessa Broker Trust and their um, help and support and, and also to my supervisor, Ingrid Mainland. So thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, that, that was really interesting and, and I'm particularly um, intrigued by this, um, where, where all the answer is. <laughs> so uh, I'd be really interested um, if you kind of figure that out or find out more about that. Um, that would be great to, it's a bit of a mystery, but that would be great to find out um, where it's going um, basically or what's going on with that. Um, I know um, we are running a little bit behind, but there is a question in the chat, Catherine, which hopefully maybe you'll be able to answer in the chat for us. Um, and if anybody else has any questions for Catherine or, or um, anybody else, um, please do pop them in there and we'll try and um, get those answered as we're moving on. Um, so um, thank you again. And we'll head on now um, to um, a presentation from Ryan Prescott at the University of Hull. Thank you, Ryan. Um, yeah, so I'm at the University of Hull. So I'm currently doing a PhD um, in my third year now. Um, so my work focuses on landscape archaeology, really. Um, so the subject is the reign of King Stephen, which um, takes place during the 12th century. Um, so just to give you a bit of a bit more of a context to this, because this paper is based on one of four themes that my PhD looks at. And I've had to separate them in that way because there's so much material. Um, this was the easiest and the best sort of way to look at the trend. So this paper focuses on the people, the demographic data behind the castles of the period. So for anyone who doesn't really know much about the period, um, the reign of King Stephen, so 1135 to 1154, so 19 years, has long been condemned as a period of anarchy. The creation of a large number of earldoms has gone in hand in hand with the assumption that the castles which define the period were built without royal permission, and we just see hundreds, if not thousands of them, if we believe the contemporary sources. So the 12th century has typically been studied from historical sources, so chroniclers of the time, 
um, but also some 19th and 20th century historians have looked at government records, which came after in the reign of Henry II. But interestingly, archaeology um, and, and, and an archaeological perspective just really hasn't been applied to this period since, um, well, it's only really begun in the past five years. There was a study um, in the south of England, so Creighton and Wright, which are some of the biggest sort of key players in um, castles um, today, um, have done some survey work. But again, it's all focused on the southeast and southwest. There's always a south southern bias with a lot of things. Um, but in terms of this archaeological study, their parameters have been focused down there where Stephen and Matilda's um, respective power bases were. However, my research is now looking um, at the archaeological evidence, but local to me, so Lincolnshire and Yorkshire. So the reason why I've chosen those areas is partly selfish because I live here, but also um, interestingly, um, a lot of the key events that actually take place during the 19 years do feature here. The only two pitch battles of the period, so Battle of the Standard and Battle of Lincoln took place in this region. Um, so I think it's just an interesting prism to look at the buildings, so predominantly the castles, but also some of the terminology. Castles is a broad term for the entire period, so castles could mean anything from churches, um, monastic sites, siege castles, and anything basically that was purposed for um, the conflict. Um, so my paper in this respect, um, so like I said, this section is looking at the people, so the demographic which were responsible for the castles and the other fortifications of the period, is arguing that actually um, the conflict wasn't as bad or pervasive as what historians and earlier chroniclers have said. Um, in fact, the buildings actually do more represent the sort of social and economic and political aspirations of the people at that time when power, wealth and status became increasingly important. It's something we recognise for later periods, but it's not typically applied to this one. So I think it's an interesting um, sort of topic to sort of flip, flip the argument around and look at the archaeology. So as we very much know, uh, we'll have been taught it millions of times in school. Uh, the Norman conquest took place in 1066. So in that time, we have significant political, economic and social changes. However, there was a lot of continuity as well. Um, and that is sort of now recognised for the for the reign of William the first in the sense that um, it's not understood for the reign of King Stephen. However, I'm sort of arguing that there are some sort of similarities and there's a little bit more of continuity than what we maybe would expect. Um, but the stability when William I took the crown um, was again tested in 11, 1135 when Stephen was also crowned king, when he crowned himself king. Um, and one of the ways in which this stability has supposedly been tested was when he created a large number of earldoms so the country was divided into different areas, as you know, from doomsday. Um, however, William I didn't really, the amount of honours that Stephen introduced was a lot larger than basically what existed in the previous century. So historians have taken fault with that and said that that is reflective of the sort of negative circumstances of the period. Um, but I, in this paper, we'll look at sort of the earldoms that the fortifications are then based within and what that sort of shows about the period at large. Um, so as well as looking into the social changes which affected the ruling elite, um, we must look at other avenues of ownership as well. So land holding documents, licenses to coronal eight, because um, again, unlicensed castles or adulterine castles, which they're also regarded as, um, are again seen as evidence for the instability of this period. Um, but again, that's always been looked at from a historical lens, but the archaeology can perhaps challenge some of those perceptions. Um, and again, looking at some moated sites. So again, fortifications, um, you get them a lot in rural areas, but typically in the 13th and 14th centuries. Um, moated sites are again classed as fortifications because they have that sort of um, military edge, the facade of moats and, you know, gatehouses and things like that. Um, and they can also reveal a little bit more about the status and sort of the political circumstances of the period and what the motivations of these people were. Um, so moving on. Um, well, actually, let's just go back to this one here. 
Um, a little bit about the terminology. So Aldrich Vitalis is again one of the um, main sort of players that we have that we come to acknowledge the 12th century. So he was writing about the events at the time. Um, negative connotations had existed when William I became king. Um, castles was regarded as something foreign and intrusive in the landscape, even though they really did appear well before 1066. Um, it wasn't such a sudden change. Um, feudal, feudalism also brought changes, but again, it was made amenable to the Anglo-Saxons. Um, Burrs had already existed. Um, and again, the castle here, you see at Ludlow, um, when the Normans started to build their castles, there are actually some sort of cultural and symbolic similarities between these buildings. So William I recognised that when he took power, that this couldn't necessarily just be reliant on military strength. There has to be some sort of cultural exchange. Um, otherwise, you cannot hope to rule a new country in that way. Um, so the Normans utilised existing models of lordly expression to legitimise their succession. So it's, as well as having fortifications based on similar ideas, um, the power structure of the Anglo-Saxons was also tweaked and adapted, but there was con continuity, is what um, the argument is, um, that would bring more stability to his position as king, and again would make his power more um, just easier. So land holdings were placed. Some Anglo-Saxon landowners kept their power, but other um, important Norman families gained a lot of power and influence, especially in Yorkshire and Lincolnshire too. So we have a lot of names like the De Lacy's, um, again, held significant parts of land and that continued well into the 12th century as well, which is, comes into the period that I'm looking at. So looking at the earldoms and how the political sort of environment had changed or perhaps not had changed by the 12th century, when Stephen became king, historians acknowledged that just before um, Stephen, um, we have Henry I, and we only have seven earldoms in 1135. But between 1138 and 1140, so only in the infancy of Stephen's reign, we now have at least 12 earldoms, which might not sound a lot, but for the country, it was quite a significant change. Um, and then that came alongside a proportionate increase in the number of buildings, churches, castles, and other fortifications that appeared in these lands at that time. Um, so looking at a little bit more about sort of the demographic trends and who was responsible for these buildings, um, the little map there shows you the study area which was created with GIS. So GIS will be used more in my next um, chapter. Um, but just for context, that does show you the study area and the 168 sites which form sort of the 11th and 12th centuries in this, in this locality. Um, so again, just to show you another quote there, um, which I, I'm challenging with the archaeology, um, historians have taken sort of the contemporary sources from the time. So again, Alderic Patalis writing that the earldoms and sort of that the changes to the power structure was basically disproportionate to that of the crown, um, which I don't necessarily agree with. Um, yes, if you look at the statistics, you see that nearly three quarters, so 71.3% of the buildings did belong to the secular elite, um, only 6.5%. And this is taking into account William I, um, William Rufus, Henry I and Stephen, they only collectively held from 1066 to this period, 6.5%, um, and then ecclesiastical, so bishops and other ruling elite members, monastic sites, 12%. Uh, so these statistics do, in some ways, affirm what, on face value at least, what the chroniclers and historians would say that, well, actually, this is disproportionate to that of the crown. But actually, if we look at the earlier period with William I, um, he was praised for promoting people who were loyal to him. Um, Stephen only did the same thing, just on a slightly larger scale, is what I'm arguing. Um, and again, the landscape was actually more complex than what we're saying, because we have 12.5% that do belong to the um, Ecclesiastes. That's something that doesn't, that's an argument that's never put forward by historians or again, uh, chroniclers of the 12th century. It's always the secular um, elite who are classed as selfish and greedy, um, but there are other people who are responsible for this at this time as well, so it's not necessarily fair to just blame them as the people for doing this. Religious groups such as the Knights, Knights Templars and Knights Hospitallers, again, are represented in the ecclesiastical section. 
actually continued their efforts unaffected and prospered from the conflict. Um, Stephen again supported their actions and one of the case studies in my data set is the preceptory at Eagle and Swinethorpe, one that he personally gave money to and supported. Um, actually the, the church greatly prospered um, from the 12th century, showing again that there's a bit of a paradox between what its members wrote about the, the impact of the conflict and the reality. Um, arguably, they've left more of an enduring impact on the period than the actual conflict did itself. Um, so Stephen's earldom policy has long been seen as one of the principal forces behind the precariousness of the 12th century, um, threatening his own position. But again, William I did exactly the same. Um, I would argue that the balance of power did not drastically alter. Um, and in fact, it was plausibly one of the only ways that this could be achieved at this time. And we must also acknowledge that as well during the 11th, 12th, 13th century, we have a massive population increase. And it was only logical that a purport, you know, an increase was also met with the ruling elite as well. Um, they were only exercising the power that they had been afforded since the 11th century. So if we move on to licenses to crenellate, which again is another key argument that historians have sort of thrown at the period that the, cat, the period was defined and defined by unlicensed um, adulterine castles, which were built without authority from the crown. Um, so again, traditional scholarship has agreed that the evils of the anarchy were due primarily to the unrestricted buildings of the castles. And that's a quote that even was only written 20 years ago by one of the main um, castle studies um, academics today. Um, so it's thought that with the lands and titles that they gained, um, and the earldoms that we've just seen, they exercised their power on a level that was unparalleled. Um, license to crenellate have been looked at usually in later periods, um, but you do see a few examples coming through in the 12th century. So I would argue that there are actually a few instances coming through in the earlier period that maybe have been overlooked before. Um, so they form a bit of an, a valuable insight because they show that dialogue between sort of the Ecclesiastes again, it's not just the secular elite, it is the bishops as well, and the crown. So it's that dialogue, um, them putting themselves on a bit of more of a higher plane and the power and the land that they now are becoming more conscious of. They're not necessarily exercising it in a way that was unstable and new. They were just having more of a consciousness and more of a um, an obligation to express it as the 12th century um, and the Norman rule sort of really took off. Um, so um, again, another quote there was that we see upwards of well over a thousand castles. The archaeology just does not support that data. It's something I looked at a little bit more closely in my previous um, um, chapter, that, which came before that, which looked at the buildings, how many, what they were and when they were built. Um, so this one's really looking at the people um, which drove that. So that um, charter extract you see below there is one that just comes from um, one of the castles in my study region in Lincolnshire. So again, it's Gainsborough, but it also went by a different name, uh, which was Thonic. Um, so again, some of the language which Charles Coulson, which again is one of the main academics with castles and licenses to crenellate, um, the language, the syntax you see here um, very much echoes what you see in the later periods. But again, it's not something that's typically seen until or acknowledged until 13th, 14th centuries, but we do start to see it coming through. So I would say that even though some of the licenses here have been sort of hoo hard and they're not necessarily supported, um, they do acknowledge sort of the transfer of land holdings and sort of that really idea that the people are more bothered about their immediate social political status in the lands that they have rather than they're actually worried about the wider conflict itself. Um, and moving swiftly on to moated sites. So again, this is another manifestation of their increasing consciousness and their, their acknowledgement of their place in society. So moated sites, again, are always seen as lesser fortifications. Um, so moated sites, you tend to get them in rural areas, so Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, but they typically come in at the 13th and 14th centuries um, as sort of other monuments and um, changes to the land and salt production and everything's sort of really progressing. Um, but there are some examples at this period in time too, which is extremely interesting when historians and chroniclers alike have told us that the period was 
characterized by widespread um, castle building that they were all built for specific immediate and short term response to the conflict. And as soon as they were used, they disappeared from the record entirely. Um, so why would you have moated sites which actually do transcend that? So it's an interesting um, class of monument to look at within this period um, because they do show you a little bit more about the social structure of the period and how it was changing. Um, not, not, not necessarily changing in terms of its relationship to the crown, but more in the sense of their relationship to each other and how the people within this hierarchy saw themselves. Um, so I would say the social changes was, were happening regardless of the conflict. Um, in some ways, the conflict just allowed them to have a little bit more of a, a freer reign, but not, not certainly anarchic. Um, so previous work by my supervisor, actually Helen Fenwick at the department um, in her PhD, I think a good 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, she looked at moated sites, but from more of a later period, but some of the implications for that research was that we potentially see during the 12th century, the dawning idea that there was a social rank lower than that of the knight. Um, so this research here really picks up on that and especially within the, within the context of Stephen's reign. Um, it shows that really when we have this slight increase in um, earldoms and then more people from the 11th century have become more established in their domains, um, we start to see perhaps a little bit more of a substructure, as you would expect anyway, with any um, hierarchy. There's always um, different levels within what you have. Like today, you have billionaires, you have millionaires, but then you have billionaires and there's, there's such variation within the framework you see. Uh, moted sites, I think, do show that substructure that's coming through. Um, so while they could perform... Um, protection for the people who live there. Um, I would also argue that they do form residences and acted as symbols of lordship within the lands that they do, that they were sited in. Um, and again, they just tend to be neglected, especially within this um, specific reign. Um, moated sites, again, um, are a much easier, quicker and cheaper um, form of monument. So if you had gained um, some level of wealth and influence in society, but you maybe couldn't afford to build a castle. Um, a moated site was possibly one of the other alternative ways that could be done. And um, I think the construction of a moated site would have formed one of the best ways to achieve the obligations and expectations of their social class. Um, and to perhaps to have not observed this would have been risking um, not necessarily, you weren't, seen as fashionable if you didn't necessarily have a moat. Um, it's just like today when neighbours build things and they tend to copy each other. It's the same idea here, I think. Um, moats were there for a fashion um, and they sort of fit um, with the what I'm trying to argue here. Uh, so like I said, this paper's formed one of the four themes. Um, so the first one looked at what was built, how many and um, what it shows about the period and how they were intended to be used. This one has looked at the people, um, but specifically looking at how the power structure wasn't disproportionate and um, England's magnets were exercising power that was perhaps only expected that they would exercise. And they were doing it through other means, um, fashion, money, wealth, power status, all these ideas were coming through regardless of the conflict. Um, the next one will look more at geography and landscape um, using GIS, so it will use more of um, images like here and looking at trends in urban rural areas, rivers, um, visibility, all that sort of thing. Um, and then the final one will specifically look at how many buildings, fortifications actually featured in conflict. And it's interesting because some of the early results show that very few were um, actually involved in any form of conflict or were slighted. So again, um, showing that the perceptions of the period that I'm talking about really have been overplayed and archaeology can show a very different perspective than um, what's really been done before. Um, so thank you very much. That's a very brief look at the bibliography, but I'm happy to send things on to people if, if they're interested. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. That was brilliant. Um, 
uh, as I said with, with the previous ones, if, if people have any questions, um, pop your hand up, please. Um, otherwise, if you can pop them in the chat for Ryan to have a look at, um, that would be brilliant. We're playing a little bit of catch up as well. So if you do have any questions, popping them in the chat probably a bit easier. Um, and Ryan, if, if you want to share any um, links or information about where we can find out more or contact you with, with anything, that would be brilliant. But thank you very much. Um, that's fascinating. Um, we are moving now on to our next talk, which is um, uh, by Alfie Talks, there you go, <laughs> fantastic, um, from um, the University of York, um, and you're giving the pre presentation entitled My Closest Heritage. Thanks very much, Alfie. Welcome. So, welcome to my presentation on My Closest Heritage. As part of my PhD of informing our heritage futures, preserving our digital pasts. My name is Alfred Talks, and I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of York, working alongside the Archaeology Data Service and Historic England. So within this presentation, I'll be talking about the aims, how I believe that combining tangible and intangible data sets will create new research opportunities. Then move on to digital dissemination, how we need to com communicate back with the people digitally. From this, I'll move on to my case study of the ASOP project. I will argue why intangible heritage data was captured in this, the types of audience reached, and also the data sets and capture techniques that I used to make sure it was such a success. Lastly, I'll talk about my future research, what I'm doing in my current PhD, which is focusing primarily on high streets. So what is intangible heritage? Many people define it in many different ways. However, UNESCO defines it as being inclusive, representative, and being community-based. Whilst for my own research, I define it as being the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, skills, and cultural spaces associated therewith that communities, groups, and individuals recognize as part of their cultural heritage. So in essence, it's the archaeology that cannot be touched. So, what are the aims of my research? Morgan and Eve stated that as the world becomes more digital, we need to communicate with people like Christ. As a result, we need to provide a platform, a space for people to actually engage with local heritage. We need to create an environment where people feel safe and can be part of a digital community. And from this, we can also contribute it to capture both tangible and intangible heritage. If we're capturing both, we're going to get a much richer and useful data set. And as a result, by compiling local stories with heritage documents, we're going to produce new research channels and new interesting research opportunities. So for my case study of the ASOL project, I investigated these aims. ASOL is a small village in the north of Hertfordshire between Cambridge and London. And within my research, I captured the breadth of Asphalt's heritage in the form of a progressive web app. For those who don't know, a progressive web app is basically a website, but with functionality of geolocation and notifications and several other things. And as a result, it works more as a native app. Within this, I captured formal heritage records and anecdotal stories. And as a result, it produces quite a interesting data set. And this itself was a living digital record where people could interact with it as and when they wished. For the idea of a participatory GIS, where a community and individuals can interact with it as and when they wish. So why was intangible heritage collated through this research? Oh, well, I believe that everyone has a story. Everyone has a story where they grew up, what the things they used to do. And I believe that these narratives are really important to the archaeological record. They get to see what is significant to people and why it is. And for me, it was a unique opportunity, a unique opportunity to actually document it. So I could gather all of these interesting stories together as long as alongside the heritage documentation itself. One of the aspects I really researched was the audience. According to those researchers there, the use of smartphones can engage new audiences. And as a result, I really wanted to combine digital technology to allow this to be the case. And there are three main groups that I was aiming for. The first of these are family groups enjoying a day out. 
Here, digital narrative is regulated in a way that it can be bite-sized. And this was alongside lots of photographs and visual elements, so that it could be accessible to both children and adults. The second group that I was targeting was isolated individuals who wanted to feel part of the community. In Astral, it is quite an aging population, and there's quite a lot of research how an aging population may not be very technically able. And as a result, it had very simple navigation. It was very easy to use, and I gave talks as well in training sessions on how to use it. And as a result, it allowed some of the elderly to actually explore the local stories and feel part of a greater community. The last group that I was researching was a museum and school group, which were giving tours around the village. Here, I wanted lots of individuals to create a narrative, create a walking tour of a particular element that they were researching. Say it was where the doctors lived in the village, where the surgeries had moved over time. They were able to do this through the app. Another aspect that I was really trying to research was the capturing and dissemination techniques. As I said, there's lots of elderly people in Aswell, and as a result, I needed to make sure that it was accessible for those who are technophobic. And both of these, both the capturing and dissemination targeted this. So for the capturing, written forms and interviews were used so that people could actually put their stories in if they didn't have access to the technology themselves through the digital divide. But at the same time, I used computational techniques of data harvesting and app functionality so that I could harvest quite a lot of different data sets, but also individuals themselves could add their own stories. It's also important to consider dissemination with the, with the digital divide. Here, I believe that through public presentations, I was able to show the importance of the research and why it was taking place to those who couldn't access the actual app. But as well as this, people could access the data through the app itself, as well as a website where people could understand what the research was behind it. There was also a range of data sets that I used. As I said, I used tangible and intangible data sets. For here, I used listed buildings, PAS, HDR, and ADS records, the more authoritative documents, the things that are often included. But I also wanted to make sure that local museum records were included, things that sometimes can be missed in the archaeological record. I also wanted to make sure that intangible records were collated. And for this, I used colloquial stories and photographs. And many people have lots of photographs at home, but they very rarely get added to the archaeological data set. But also a list of significant places that would definitely be excluded. For example, I captured a tree at where a child would climb up and watch their cricket. Just these lovely stories that I was actually able to capture. So where does that lead me now? I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of York. As I said, I'm working alongside Historic England and the Archaeology Data Service. And despite working primarily on the high street, I really want to make sure that I can utilize these techniques as it shows that it was really powerful for the Astral Project. I believe it can lead to huge results huge research results. So why is this research particularly important now? Everyone knows that the high street is struggling commercially. And as a result, it's becoming less of a place where people want to spend time. At the same time, however, lots of data is being created through GIS and historic building analysis and LIDAR. And as a result, huge data sets are being created, but are they actually accessible to those who actually want to research? I also believe that we need to engage back with the community about the local archaeology. We need to show them how their little village is important for the heritage and why it is important that we think they know it's important. But lastly, I want to create a vision of the future of the high street. I want to reclaim it and turn it back into the community space that it originally was. Make it back into a community space so people actually want to spend time and can hang out. So in this presentation, I talked about the aims, my case study and future research. For the aims, I spoke about why communicating digitally is really important to make sure we can get to new audiences that we didn't already. Also how combining tangible and intangible data sets can lead to new research opportunities, but also richer data sets. And that through combining local stories and heritage documents, we can create a very unique opportunity. 
and that through public engagement, it's really important that we communicate that very digitally. For my case study, I showed why intangible heritage data sets were included, how these can provide a new, new research channels which aren't explored already, but also a range of audiences that can be reached who you may not originally think from the digital divide, but also the types of data sets and capture techniques that you can use to make sure that it is as rich as possible in the data set. Lastly, for my future research, how my PhD, which is primarily focused on the high streets can combine these technologies to lead to great results. And why it is particularly important now, as we all want to hang out on the high street. These are my references. And if you have any questions, please do let me know or go to my website in the corner. Thank you, Alfie, that was brilliant. Um, again, uh, any questions, please do pop them in the chat. Um, as, as we're kind of catching up with the program, but uh, the, the content's been fantastic. So thank you ever so much, Alfie, and that's really interesting. If you can pop, like the others have, any contact details or, or your website link uh, in the chat, that would be helpful. And um, I say, anybody, please do um, ask questions, U utilize that chat box. Um, as we move on to our next presenter, um, which is a, a recorded presentation that um, Alex is, is going to share. Um, uh, but this is a presentation from Joshua, and I think Joshua is here, um, uh, possibly, I'm not sure, <laughs> but if he is, um, uh, you can pop yourself uh, in the chat, um, Joshua, um, uh, just to say hello. Um, but the presentation um, is being shared now. Thank you. Hello. My name is Joshua Tolson, and welcome to my presentation. Um, I'll be speaking about my research that I undertook during my master's in environmental archaeology at the University of Sheffield, titled Looking for Lead, a geochemical study of lead pollutants in soils and sediments within the Roman Vicus at Navio, Derbyshire. My research aims when going into this project were primarily to explore if lead working could be identified in, our, in the archaeological soils and sediments that were recovered from the research area the University of Sheffield has in close proximity to the fort where Roman activity is confirmed. And to do that, I used geochemical analyses. However, because this is a stratigraphic study, in order to understand these or interpret these results, we needed to understand how lead pollutants dispersed stratigraphically in the soils and sediments. So a review of the material in profile needed to occur. Uh, we also needed to review the role of modern anthropogenic lead in the area to discern whether or not that would have had a significant impact on the pollutions we see when we were doing our surveys. So the methods that were applied to achieve these aims were kept quite deliberately as uniform and straightforward as possible to ease the research and also to aid in standardization of the results. Um, in the summer of 2019, the excavations were undertaken and uh, the largest trench that was excavated in that time, we set out a grid of one meter squares in the trench and we systematically sampled at intervals down the profile as the trench was continually excavated. These samples were then stored until uh, post-excavation research could begin. As that began, we started by air drying the samples to homogenize water content. This was particularly important as earlier in the excavation, we had quite a um, adverse weather condition where the samples became very waterlogged. And in fact, that did impact the, the recovery of some samples. We had to miss some out, unfortunately, due to just the quantity of water that was present. After that was done, we uh, agitated the samples in order to stop clumping and we also removed any large stones to prevent anomalous revolt results from being recorded in the in the PXRF analyses. The PXRF was then undertaken over a series of days where a uh, test stand mode was used, which is in essence a uh, an artificial stand that contains the x-rays and standardizes the distance between the PXRF portable X-ray fluorescence and the 
sample that you're trying to analyze uh, that of course helps with standardization and also protects the user from the x-rays that the PXR would emit. Following that, after we'd finished all the samples through PXRF, we also analyzed them with, their mag with magnetic susceptibility equipment to determine whether or not the samples had been magnetized to try and figure out the context of the, of the results of lead. In essence, was there any burning, was there smelting or lead working? And we also decided to use particle size analysis as a proxy for the ability for lead pollutants to move down the profile. Uh, there are previous studies, which I'm happy to provide if anyone's interested, that suggest that the smaller the particulate, the easier it is for lead pollutants to transport down a profile. Derbyshire is okay. a modern <laughs> county in uh, the north of England. Uh, one of its main characteristics is that it encompasses a great deal of the Peak District. The Peak District is a national park in the north of England, and it is an area of outstanding beauty. One feature of this is that its topography and geography is generally very hilly and mountainous, and is generally not very um, easy to traverse. As a result, in the archaeological record, um, a lot of the activity is confined to areas that are more hospitable and more easily traversable. One such area is the Hope Valley. Uh, this runs across much of the Peak District and has archaeological deposits that range from the Neolithic all the way through to the modern period. Uh, for the pertinence of this study, there is quite a significant amount of, of Roman finds across Derbyshire and particularly in the Peak District and the Hope Valley itself. Um, as can be seen in the map on this screen, there is quite a significant amount of activity and Bruff, which you can see in the centre northern portion of the figure, is um, quite a linch point for the joining uh, defensive fortifications and industry that the Romans had created in the area. The fort of uh, Navio that's located at Profondo was founded a, around 80 AD at the confluence of the rivers at No and Bradwell Brook on a small rise that helps uh, with sight, line of sight and visibility. Um, it is likely that the fort was founded to ensure safe passage through the Hope Valley and to protect transportation and trade around this area. The fort had two main phases of occupation with a short period of abandonment. Um, these are delineated in the first phase with earth and timber defences, which then become more permanent stone defences in the second phase of occupation. Uh, this defence has often been interpreted as being involved in the lead trade, which was very prominent coming out of Derbyshire, uh, lead being one of the most um, desirable commodities to be extracted in the region. Archaeological evidence does identify the first cohort of Aquitinians as residing within the fort, a altar that was recovered from one of the excavations, which is now present in Buxton Museum, uh, attests to that. And uh, outside the fort, uh, an associated vicus has been identified. Although its scope is still largely unknown, there is, there is known activity to the north and to the southeast of the fort. Um, the site, it now includes a public right-of-way which runs across the, the, the main area of the fort. You can still see some small remains of the strong room and some of the later defences are still visible. And there is a rise where the, um, the walls would have been. However, the state of uh, the archaeology is generally relatively poor. Excavations at Navio uh, began in the 20th century and are recorded as having 
begun shortly after the conclusion of the First World War. For the work on Navio, I would highly recommend anybody who's interested go and read Martin Dern's work from 1993, where he wrote a BAR which compiled the archaeological reports up to that point. The report suggests that initially the excavations focused on the fort itself. Um, only in the 1980s did geo geophysical surveys begin uh, in the surrounding areas to try and identify the Vickers. These were undertaken by the University of Sheffield and they were followed up by watching briefs in the area. Uh, this was relatively successful and began to give a picture of the uh, extent of the Vicus around the fort. Commercial activity also aided in our understanding of where the Vicus um, ends. There's a shale quarry to the north of the site and this has uh, been increasingly encroaching on the archaeology and has allowed for reports to be produced that more clearly define in this area at least where the Vicus ends. Um, however, as I've previously said, the excavations are still very much ongoing in the research side of things and if COVID had not been such a, a large part of our lives for the last two years I'm sure we would be further ahead but the University of Sheffield as I understand does still have um, excavations planned for the summer of 2022. These are hopefully going to continue the work that we did in 2019 and uh, hopefully further excavations will aid us in creating a clear distinction of the exact remit of the Vickers uh, in all directions around the fort. The 2019 excavations that were undertaken by the University of Sheffield comprised of four trenches. Each trench was dug at a point of interest that was identified in the geophysical survey that was undertaken in the field in which the research was being uh, undertaken. Trench 1, the largest of the trenches that were excavated, was chosen to be studied further in my research. That was because Trench 1 contained multiple features. They are currently interpreted as either kilns or ovens. However, in they were the most likely features to be associated with lead working. Trench 1 being the largest trench also gave us the highest volume of samples to analyse and therefore gave us a broader picture of what was occurring in the wider region than any other trench would have. Trench 1 also had a large lead find recovered which is currently interpreted as a lead sprue. This had a piece of Roman pottery embedded in it, therefore dating it or help or potentially dating it to the Roman period, which further um, made us think that Trench 1 was the, the, the best candidate for our study. When I was investigating the local area to determine whether or not modern anthropogenic activity could have impacted the geochemical results that I uh, received, from my analyses, I discovered two major sources of pollution that had the potential to impact my results. The first was uh, car emissions. As previously uh, in the automotive industry, um, petrol was not unleaded as it is today, and it did contain lead. This meant that exhaust fumes had lead in them and lead particulate wood um, be released into the atmosphere in quite large quantities. Given that, as we've previously discussed, the Hope Valley is one of the, the few more hospitable and more traversable areas of the Peak District, this meant that traffic was um, concentrated in the area. Therefore, the two main roads that run uh, very close to the site would have had the ability to expose the area to quite a significant amount of lead. The second main instigator of modern lead pollution was a white lead factory that was discovered being 
only 150 metres away from our research area. That, of course, being an area that would put out quite a lot of lead pollution, given that they were physically working lead in an industrial capacity, that was a, quite a serious problem and something that, I, that had not been previously addressed in studies of lead on the site. Indeed, um, research does suggest that having such a large amount of pollution outputted in such close proximity, there is a high likelihood that there would have been quite a lot of deposition from that particular industry in the area. The distribution of lead pollutants in this particular sweep, which was the first full sweep that we were able to undertake in the in the trench, um, highlighted that there wasn't a significant increase in readings within the features that were found in the trench. Um, this was initially somewhat disappointing as it ruled out the option for these our features to be related to lead working. However, there is a notable increase in readings surrounding these features, which uh, has been interpreted as um, an increase in lead pollution due to a high level of domestic activity. If this hypothesis is correct, um, which it, it may not be, but it was outside the scope of this project, uh, it would mean that lead pollutants could be used as a proxy for undo undocumented pathways in the Roman period, which is a very exciting result. Um, otherwise, the results were definitely heightened. They were, they were not nothing. Uh, and that is in line with the understanding of Romans generally and their uh, use of lead, which, which is much higher than their uh, Iron Age counterparts. Um, which would then lead to an overall pollution from just general use. However, these again, these results are not high enough uh, when compared with known lead working areas to suggest that any sort of lead working was occurring in the trench. When I looked at the results in a stratigraphic context, it was clear that the um, highest results were on average found at the surface um, and subsequently declined as the stratigraphy deepened. Uh, we saw 85.7% of samples uh, directly below the surface were lower than those at the surface. Um, subsequently, uh, the next survey had 80% less than that survey and the final survey had 60% less than the survey before it. This does suggest a um, origin of lead pollution coming from the surface and this reducing as the stratigraphy deepens. However, it also allows for uh, archaeological lead to be interfering with deeper sweeps to slow down the dispersion of lead in the soils. So, in conclusion, we have discovered that it's incredibly likely that modern anthropogenic pollution had a significant impact on at least the higher stratigraphy of the trench and the wider survey area. This called into question the validity of the higher level survey that has previously been undertaken in the area and may suggest that a resampling of some of this area, particularly closer to where the roads and the lead factory were, could be expedient. Um, we also discovered that unfortunately there was no lead work incurring in the trench, which by extension suggests that there's probably not any lead work incurring in the immediate vicinity either, as there would be some level of uh, transference of pollution in the immediate area. However, we did manage to identify a potential use for lead pollutants as a proxy for undocumented walkways, which is very exciting and is definitely an avenue of research that I think should be pursued. I believe that going forward there are some uh, particular paths of research that are quite pertinent and could be significant in adding to the narrative of the site, particularly in relation to 
the um, lead production. I think that uh, we need to continue to refine our methodological approaches to stratigraphic geochemical surveys as uh, the number of them are very small and the capacity for them are clearly very helpful in circumstances where we have a lot of anthropogenic activity, uh, for instance, the white lead factory and roads impacting surface survey data. Uh, I think that as a result of this, there should be an exploration of potential resampling of some areas that have previously been surveyed, as there is the likelihood that the modern anthropogenic activity may have skewed the results and may not be showing archaeologists and researchers the particular uh, nuances of the lead pollution that would have been present during the Roman period. Um, more tangibly, however, I think that the one avenue of research that has yet to be explored are the waterways themselves. I think that as a site that's been so um, altered by its presence near waterways, the fact that no archaeological activity has really been undertaken in either of the rivers is quite surprising and I think that there's a lot of remit for uh, normal archaeological excavation or mitigation or at least um, non-geochemical work but I also think that we have the ability to undertake geochemical surveys in proximity of the rivers and I think that we should be taking advantage of that to really figure out if these waterways played a significant role in the trade and the um, the network of activity that spread out from this fort that is identified from the, the roads. So thank you very much for listening. Um, unfortunately, due to prior commitments, I will not be uh, presenting this live, so I'll be unable to take any questions you may have. However, I will leave my contact details up on this slide. I will also provide them to the coordinators. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Or if you'd like to discuss this further with me, I am always open to talking about this. And um, yeah, thank you very much. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Brilliant. That, um, so I, just, um, I know he's not here, but I'll, I'll thank him anyway because he might look at the recording. So thank you very much, Joshua. That was fabulous. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, uh, we will um, share his email address um, in the chat um, so that you can um, uh, follow up with him yourself. Um, brilliant. So um, I, I apologise that we are still running behind, but um, we've got two more presentations to, to close out the session, and they're and they're both fabulous as well. So um, we have another recorded um, presentation, but I believe that Jasper is in the audience as well. So if there's any questions for Jasper, again, please pop them in the chat box. Um, my colleague Alex will share um, uh, the presentation, and it's about the Battle of Cheriton, the application of systematic metal detecting survey in GIS plotting. Um, Thanks very much. Good afternoon. My name is Jasper Sam from McFadden. I have recently graduated from the University of Winchester and I am currently starting and undertaking an MSc at the University of Southampton. I am going to talk to you about my dissertation project centered on the application of systematic method detecting and GIS plotting as I applied it to the field work I undertook for my dissertation at the English Civil War Battlefield site of Cheriton. The development of battlefield archaeology is a relatively new discipline. Although individual cases can be found dating back to the 19th century, the current discipline can be found to have started in the 1970s. In the 1970s, a survey of the battlefield site at Master Moor in Civil War 1644 was conducted using field walking, resulting in the recovery of ammunition dropped during the battle. This survey did not incorporate the use of metal detecting and so gained limited understanding of the size of the battlefield. The 1983 Little Bighorn National Monument Survey by Fox and Scott, which recorded evidence from the Battle of Little Bighorn, 1875, was the first published example of how retrieved evidence from the battlefield site can be interpreted and then compared with historical documents. In the UK, Glenford in 1995 
publish the first example of the identification of a major medical site using the evidence from the parent artifacts detected by metal detectorists. The design of the fieldwork methodology for the Battle of Chelmsford 2 field survey was based on aspects of previous battlefield archaeology surveys, including the work undertaken by Tim Sutherland, Townsend in 1996, and Glenn Ford and Anne Curry at the newly identified battlefield site of Bosworth in 2009. As stated by Sutherland, there are a multidisciplinary array of techniques available to locate physical evidence of conflict. For the two field survey undertaken as part of my visit, at the site of the English Civil War, Battle of Chelsea in 1644, a systematic meditating survey was used because it built on the surveying techniques deployed during these previous surveys. The methodology developed at Bosworth built on the undertaking between 2004 and 2007 at Hedgehill by Ford and others. This photo shows systematic meditating conducted on Bosworth Battlefield in 2010. The focus of my dissertation was based on two fields which adjoined the northern edge of Chelton Wood, which from the historical contemporary accounts was the site of the initial confrontation between the royalists and parliamentarians on the morning of the battle. These were the site for what are referred to in the dissertation as the two field survey. These two fields were of particular interest because although they would appear to be highly relevant in the sources they were conspicuous by the fact that they appeared not to have been covered by previous metal detecting surveys. Two field, the two field survey was built on previous archaeological work carried out on the Battle of Geraldton site. An early investigation was conducted by father and son metal detectorist James and Michael McGovern, who between 1974 and the late 1990s detected over a large part of the commonly defined battlefield. The work they undertook did not conform to any present accepted battlefield methodology. At the time of their survey, some of these methodologies did not exist. A major limitation of their work was that the McGoverns did not keep accurate records or carry out a systematic investigation. The finds were collected by field name and some details were in specific location what were recorded in notebooks. However, the recorded position of these finds were located best only within 10 metres of the find. The finds were originally stored within the archives of Winchester Museum and have since moved to Hampshire Cultural Trust. Fieldwork methodology, grid layout. The first survey section was undertaken on the western boundary, running in transit north to south across the entire width of up down field. The width of the transits were set at 2.5 metres based on Ottoman coverage as developed by work undertaken by Glenford at Bosworth Field. 2.5 meter transits accurately executed gave a sample coverage of approximately 80% of the total area. This was the highest level of coverage generally undertaken. In previous battlefield surveys, transits of five meters or 10 meters were also used on some sites, particularly where there was less clarity as to the location of the battlefield. As the two fields had not being surveyed before, optimum coverage was aimed for where feasible. To set out the survey area, firstly, a two metre cross site ranging pole was positioned two metres from the western foundry field boundary, approximately halfway down the field. This was because if it had been positioned on the field boundary, the detecting would have been prone to interfere with the metal metallic metal in, metal in the field boundary boundary fence. A second ranging pile was positioned approximately 50 metres into the field at right angles to the field boundary using the cross site in the ranging pole. The third ranging pole was placed 50 metres south of the original pole, again containing a cross site section. A fourth ranging pole was then placed 50 metres into the field at right angles to this pole, creating a four point grid. 50 metre takes were used to run a line between the areas of the poles going from west to east. At the ranging pole on the western side of the grid, a red marker flag was positioned. Then, 2.5 metre intervals, further flags were positioned so that the sequence of colours from the start ran red, yellow, red, yellow, green. This was repeated three times to 
to 50 marker points along each line. A section of this can be seen in the photo here. Detecting. To make it possible to actually detect using Garrett ACE 200i metal detectors, the, met the transits were placed up using a sweeping action one meter either side of the transit line at an average speed of one meter per second. And placing forward slowly using a motion similar to paint in the ground, traveling from north to south and then south to north along the next available transit line. The discard policy meant that the detectors kept the small finds that were possible interest, for example, lead shot and other, other, any other items that might have been related to this civil war battle, including artifacts connected to weaponry, uniforms and artillery. Also kept were any other civilian finds from our periods, for example, Roman coins. Small finds were placed in a small plastic finds bag and labelled with the initials of the detector. The date and the lead point is weight, GPS waypoint number. The labelled fine bags were then pegged to the ground and the marker flat to be retrieved at the end of the day, as shown in the photo here. GPS marking. Each field badge and marker flag along the bottom top of the edge was marked with a GPS waypoint number. Once this had been recorded, the individual four finds were logged with their own GPS waypoint number. These bags were collected at the end of the day. The GPS data was then recorded but later used within ArcGIS software to create distribution blocks. Post field work analysis GIS distribution plotting. The distribution maps here demonstrate how the combination of systematic detecting and GPS recording can then be interpreted through a GIS software to demonstrate distributions across a targeted area, in this case, the two field survey. The distribution shows the recovery of all Civil War lead based shots across the survey area. One advantage of having this level of accurate systematic plotting is that the data can then be filled in, in different ways, filtered in different ways. The image here shows the separating out of recovered shot by caliber type. By undertaking this type of analysis, it was possible to hypothesize the nature of weaponry and thereby football troop development and to cross reference these findings with the contemporary historical accounts. Proportion of recovered shot. This pie chart demonstrates the proportion of shot recovered based on infantry, musketeers, and horse. The pistol and carbine were associated with being cavalry weapons in the English Civil War. Historical accounts of the opening phase on the morning of the Battle of Cherson indicate that on both parliamentary and royalist sides, the main body of troops deployed were drawn from the foot regiment and were made up of 1,000 musketeers on each side. The evidence recovered strongly indicates the presence of a distribution caliber of weaponry deployed within the chosen target area. The finds were associated with the present military forces, which were mostly musketeers. By correlating the type and positioning of all shots recovered with the historical accounts of the battle, it could be argued that the archaeology supported the current historical interpretation of the early moments of the battle. Then Royalist forces were positioned on the northern ridge and above over the fields in Sherwood, where the parliamentarians were based. Due to finding the new archaeology that's no store, the Battle of Chetan now includes events in Upper Cowdown Field and High Field. The system of methodology methodology based on a tried and tested battlefield archaeological design led me to the finding of the two young satellites. Thank you for listening. I hope this gave you some insight into the application of metal detecting to the growing discipline of battlefield archaeology. Thank you very much, Jasper. Um, that was brilliant um, and, and just really interesting um, discussion um, um, about metal detecting, which is something that we've um, uh, uh, working on at the moment with um, 
uh, project with Historic England, um, which you might have um, heard more about. Um, but if anybody has um, any comments or feedback or questions for Jasper, please do pop them in the chat, um, as we've been doing um, for everybody else. Um, and we will move on um, to our final um, presentation today um, from um, Katerina from the University of Durham. So thank you very much, Katerina, and I'll, and I'll pass over to you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, this work uh, uh, that I'm going to explain, uh, um, with this work I'm going to explain the skill of romance uh, in adapting the building techniques uh, to the different environmental conditions. In this particular case, I'm analyzing the solution adopted for building the theatres in the area of the center and northern Italy. This presentation uh, will be looking at these key points. The notation of substructio, typologies of substructors of cave and Roman theatres in northern central Italy, building techniques and material, and finally the conclusion. Substructio. Substructions are structures built above ground in elevation, usually constructed on the cleavious soil to raise a horizontal plan at a specific height. Therefore, the substructio is an unbalanced structure with a downstream high facade and an upstream one at the soil level. As a consequence, oblique trust is transmitted to the walls, entailing the requirement of reinforcing the structure itself. The aim is to carve or to contain the earth fields that press on the back of the wall and that change in weight and volume according to the season in the case of the terrace system, for instance. Vitruvio, in the book uh, six, wrote, but the greater care must be taken in the substructures, because in this uh, immense damage is caused by the earth peeled against them, for it cannot remain uh, of the same weight as it usually has in the summer. It swells in the winter by absorbing water from the rains, Consequently, by its weight and expression, it bursts and thrusts out of the retaining walls. To avoid this damage, therefore, we must proceed as follows. The thickness of the walling must answer to the amount of earth. Next, supporting walls, anterides or buttresses, erismes, are to be carried up at the same time. The interval between them is to be the same as the height of the substructor and the thickness determined by the substructors. In this passage, Vitruvius gives advices about how to build a good substructors, listing how bad effects can, um, of atmospheric condition can influence the static of the building itself. Given this condition, supporting wall or buttresses are annexed to the wall for increasing the resistant capability. Their function is to resist under the strain transmitted by the wall. The substructures involve hypogeous compartments and vaulted spaces, entailing the presence of Tika foundation. These structures could be above and underground, or partially buried and partially unearthed or on a slope or on a silent terrain, earth peeled, but at the same time above ground and visible from the outside. However, there's a kind of substructors that Vitruvius doesn't write about. These are the hollow substructors. In these constructions, the resistant capability was entrusted to a complex morphological assemblage consist consisted of spaces vaulted. These spaces could be closed or used for any activities. At the same time, morphological assemblage was developed with intent to keep resisting as well as for aesthetic purpose. Therefore, substructors could have different shapes, those could be combined between them. I've analyzed the 45 Roman theaters in the regiones 5th, 6th, 8th, 9th. 10 and 11th. Um, this data sheet, by this study, it is, um, this data sheet, uh, it, it is organized in these voices in order to get a fully understanding of each single part of the cavea. 
if Greek theatres were mainly built against a slope, in the Roman ones we can see different architectural solutions which broke to build the cave without any natural support. Uh, by, this by this study, it is possible to recognize three main, three main typologies. The cave against a slope, hybrid cave, cave with the substructions. A previous distinctive typology of cave was made in 2011 by Sear, who elaborated a cave typology mostly based on the architectural design aspect and in finding similarities in the complex scheme of substructures, in particular making an accent on the passageways feature of these hollow structures. What lacked to be analyzed were the building techniques used to adapt the construction of theaters itself to the environment where they, were, have been, where they have been built, which must be taken into consideration. Uh, this, therefore, I um, divided uh, and, uh, these typologies of the caveat. For caveat against uh, a slope, is meant a cavea built against a slope and not a slope transformed into cavea, similar to the cavea of most Greek theaters. It can have few walls to help to sustain the cavea. Hybrid, hybrid cavea is a cavea built partially against a slope and partially on substructures. In this case, we have three main records. Substructures built against the slope, edges on free substructures and central part built against the slope, or lower part built against the slope and the rest on substructures. In these last two cases, the substructures could have earth embankment or be hollow. Lastly, there's the caveat with the substructures. Um, this means free substructures be built on a flat size constructed to realize a level course at a specific altitude. In this case, the three records identified are substructures with solid concrete fill, substructures with earth embankment, and hollow substructures, which can be combined with, between themselves. In the first record, the solid concrete fill could be limited only to sustain the lower part of the cavea and being associated with hollow or earth fill substructures. Otherwise, it could sustain the whole extension, as for instance, the theater in Monte Grotto. In the second record, there are vaulted radial compartments or covered hollow, hollow annular corridors without the use of earth embankment to sustain the standable cavea. In the third record, the earth embankment can be split or being inner radial. Um, this uh, uh, final uh, um, uh, data is uh, um, it's, uh, the final table in which uh, I explain the data that I have collected between all the theater I have analyzed. In the first, uh, the first part uh, of this table, there's uh, the types of cavea. In the second part, we have uh, a dimension with uh, the diameter of cavea and the diameter of orchestra. Then we have the techniques uh, and uh, uh, the techniques part of these structures, with the uh, preparation of the, which includes the preparation of the site, cuts, fill, stilts, uh, when they are presented and the foundation, position, plan, material, material position. Then we have the, um, the um, presence of corridor or uh, perimetral colonnade. And uh, the last column is about the presence of uh, access and passageways. Um, because, uh, um, of uh, the inadequate information on theaters belonging to the category of cavea built against a slope, there are no data on the building techniques used. In the um, theaters with hybrid cavea, under the section preparation of the site, the intervention always applied is the cut of the slope side for realizing the cavea, followed in some cases by the earth fill. 
In some cases are cut to shape the slope side for hosting the lower part of the cavea, whose earth is covered sometimes by pouring mortar to set the blocks of the sittings, as in Atri and Cividate Camuno. In other cases, there are no pourings, but the blocks of the sittings are in direct contact with the rock side, as in Urbisaglia, Teramo, Pola, Trieste, and Aquiterme. In other cases, the cut is finalized only to support the central part of the cavea. Examples are in Verona, Ivrea, and Todi. The, um, in the, this, um, in the, in the um, cavea with the substructures, two particular um, examples are the theaters of Bologna and Torino. In both cases, a huge aerial excavation has been realized, followed by the reuse of earth removed as earth embankment in function of the staticity of the building itself. In the case of Bologna Theatre, located in a declivious terrain, it's been operated an excavation of 2 and 15 meters under the planking level. Then the foundation have, has been constructed overground. overground. The inner radials have been earth fill and barrel vaulted, which have then buried by um, the earth embankment to create an artificial slope. Similar is the case of Torino, where has been operated an excavation of the area, on which has been constructed two radial walls containing an earth embankment. In the first phase of the theatres, these structures was sustained, uh, sustaining the lower part of the cavea. During the second phase, to the broaden the capacity of the cavea, instead of building other substructures along the external perimeter of the previous cavea, it has been operated a further um, excavation in the direction of the orchestra. Um, during the third phase, interesting is the intervention on the curve walls uh, of the lower part of the cavea. Those were raising together with their earth embankment. If the thought that the solution adopted for the theater in Bologna is linked to the chronological phase, as it is the oldest theater analyzed between the example in the cavern substruct with substructures, thus to the premature construction when the builders were still connected to the slope constraint, in reality, the chronology of the theater of Torino that was built with a similar technique denied this theory. Specific preparation of the soil is being identified in the area where the theater of Milano was built, constituted by incoherent terrain. In this case, an area intervention characterized by a use of Dharma stilt with variable height between 0.8 to 1.30 meter, with a section included between 0.20 and 0.25, whose upper part is buried by levels of cobbles mixed with mortar. With mortar. Um, the use of the wood stilt was finalized to compress the terrain interested by construction to stabilize the terrain itself. Over the stilt, there are usually earth fields to level the upper parts of the stilts and to create a flat for the next um, step of the building. About the foundation uh, in the theater of Milan, Milan, we have this platform foundation, two meter height, that was built on the, on, the, um, on the stilts. In addition, a simple linear foundation in cables to uh, and 10 meter height was under the stone basis of the pilasters of the colonnade. In the theater of Milan, this foundation was uh, related to allocate the loads uh, on an extended and uniform surface. The uniformity was important to avoid the eventual unbalance of the construction. The same reason had to be adopted also in the case of the theater of Montegrotto. However, for this theater, there are no information for the preparation of the site. The unstable feature of the area is also proved by a support in a future time of two annular walls added on the external facade of the cavea. Other platform foundation limited to the lower part of the cavea have been identified in the theaters of Parma, Aquileia, Concordia, Padova and Vicenza. 
They are circular platform foundation made of mortar from which radial walls are departing. Common then is the presence of annular corridor or perimeter colonnade, usually added in a second time to broaden the capacity of the cavea. Because of the major part of the structures are preserved only at the foundation level, hard is to say if it was a closed corridor with a wall running along or a colonnade. The presence of annular corridor along the perimeter of the cavea in the typology of hybrid cavea could have uh, had double functions. Under the constructive point of view, they isolated the theater from the terrain of the slopes, solving the problem of water reinfiltration when it was combed with graveled earth, as in the case of the theater in Urbisaglia, or they could sustain a superior terrace system, as in the case of Spoleto. Interesting is then the presence of a perimeter coral in the theaters of Ventimiglia, Aosta, and Torino. While in Aosta and Ventimiglia, the existence of these corals in older, uh, is older than the theaters itself. In fact, they are the remains of pre-existing buildings absorbing other function and later adapted to be part of the theaters it itself. In the case of the coral of Torino, it was built to contextualize the building of the theater in the urban plan. Um, from the map, it is clear that uh, uh, where there is a majority presence of theaters with hybrid cavea is in the central Italy, as in this part of, of in this part the predominant feature is the hilly and mountainous area in the Apennine region. However, also in, the re in this region where the settlement of the city was in a plain area, the solution was adopt uh, adopted was the cavea with free substructions. For example, uh, uh, Gubbio, Ostrawetere, Villa Potenza, and Falerone. This has to be related also to the lower cost of the material for building the theaters. At the same time, has to be noticed a major concentration of theaters with substructures in correspondence of the Po Valley, where there weren't other solutions to adopt. Even in this case, when there was the presence of a hill, the solution adopted was the hybrid cavea, except for the case of Asolo. In fact, Asolo represents a particular case with the construction of the cavea at the opposite side of the hill, sustained by three substructures, while the Shen building was built against a slope of the hill. What's been observed is that the first theater built completely on substructures is the Theater of Bologna, a northern city and not a town closer to Rome. Useful for this study is the creation of a chronological line where collocate these theaters. There is no relations between the period in which they were built and their geographical position. In fact, within the four most ancient theaters, two, Brescia and Bologna, are located in northern Italy. Beside these theaters are included in different typologies. Brescia, Spoleto, and Todi are in the typology of hybrid cavea. Bologna is in the cavea with free substructures typology. This evidence makes clear that the way of construction doesn't depend to tradition connected to the historical moment in which they have been built. If the most ancient theater is in Spoleto, uh, in the first century BC, belonging to the typology of hybrid cavea, the most ancient theater with cavea with free substructures is the Theater of Bologna. This one is the first example of theater building completely free from the slope condition, with considerable dimension, date in 1980 BC, first phase, um, earlier than the Augustian age. It's a remar remarkable building uh, uh, considering the period in which it has been constructed, when there wasn't a permanent stone, stone theater neither in Rome, and for the huge work made for the preparation of the site where it was built. The theaters built before the Augustan age are Spoleto, Todi, Bologna, Brescia, Gubbio, Monastero di Galeata, and Teramo. In Augustan age, it's evident that, that uh, theater buildings thrive in line with the cultural and political um, environment created by Augusto, in particular in the 10th and 11th regions. 
in fact, the bigger theaters realize are located in the 10th region, Verona and the major theater of Pola, both belonging to the typology of hybrid cavea. In some of the theaters analyzed, a second phase has been, has been identified that often corresponds to an extension of the theater itself, implying the addition of colonnade or perimetral corridor to sustain the upper part of the cavea. An ex ex exception um, are the theater of Monastero di Galeatta and the one of Cividate Camuno. All the second phases are dated AD 1st century, except the theater of Seravalle Scrivia, whose second phase is AD 3rd century, later than others, because it was built in the end of um, the, uh, in the end of second beginning of first century AD. The most recent theater is in Ventimiglia, belonging to the typology of, of substructures dated post AD 115 by a Trian coin founded in its foundation. These are my references and thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Caterina. Um, there is a question in the chat for you, um, which we can just very quickly um, uh, just ask because um, you might not get a chance to respond before the meeting ends and I'd hate to do that to you. Um, but um, can you see that there? It's uh, a question about a correlation between evidence no, of patient ships. Yep. Have you seen that? Yeah. No, I can't see. I don't know why. Oh, right, I'll read it. Um, so it's a, I um, uh, wondered if there was a correlation between the evidence of patronship of a theatre and the caviar construction type. Can you repeat, sorry? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, the question is asking if there is a, any correlation between the evidence of patronship of a theatre and the caviar construction type. Well, actually, uh, no yet. Um, there's, uh, I can't see a, a correlations, but we, we might think about like uh, um, a trip uh, of architects and transmissions uh, of, uh, um, of uh, knowledge of how to construct. We can think about, uh, about that. Brilliant, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and um, it, this has just been a really wonderful way, I think, to end um, the C for Innovation Festival, to end kind of on a high with, with such fantastic um, examples of, of different types of research that, that is happening. Um, so I, I want to thank everybody for coming um, and apologies for, for running over, but it was certainly worth it, I think, <laughs> um, to be honest. Um, so a great Friday afternoon um, for us. Um, and to, um, I don't know if you can do your virtual um, symbols or, or um, emoticons or whatever they are to applaud our, our fantastic speakers. So we have Elizabeth, Sonia, Catherine, Ryan, Alfie, Joshua, Jasper, and mm -hmm. Katerina. So yes, brilliant. Thank you very much um, uh, to all of you for, for presenting. I know it, it can be daunting, but it's um, brilliant to, to hear your research. Um, if anybody has any further questions, please do pass them. Um, you can send them through to CIFA and we'll pass them on, or hopefully you've got the relevant contact details. Um, but otherwise, um, this recording will be available exclusively to those on the platform for three months, and then we'll be making it more widely available. So hopefully you'll have some um, uh, additional uh, inquiries about your research. Um, and, and just keep an eye on the other stuff we're doing because it'd be great to have your input on our other events and, um, and, and everything else we're doing. And we have the CIFA conference coming up next April. So um, is there anything else I've missed? Have I plugged enough? Um, I think I've plugged enough, but wonderful. Have a great Friday afternoon and a lovely weekend. And thank you again. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you.